Uh, kia ora koutou everyone, it's now just on 12 o'clock and so we'll look to get started as others continue to join us. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining this open Zoom on our annual advice on NZETS settings. My name is Simon Neal, I'm the manager of the uh, ETS markets team here at the Commission and uh, it is my pleasure to facilitate this meeting today. Um, shortly you're going to hear from our Chief Executive Joe Hendy and uh, one of our uh, key commissioners, Catherine Lining, uh, who will take you through a series of slides. Uh, but firstly, I'll just quickly run through uh, some of the housekeeping associated with this. Uh, if you feel comfortable, it would be great if you could post your name and the organisation that you represent uh, in the chat, just so that others can see uh, who is on the line. Uh, throughout, uh, throughout the session today, we welcome your questions in the Q&A session. Uh, we will try, uh, and also when you post your questions, we'd also appreciate it if you feel comfortable, um, again, posting your name and your organisation um, when, you're, when you're posing your question. We will attempt to answer as many questions as time permits today, and for those questions that we don't get to answer, we will endeavour to respond to you uh, via email. Uh, a reminder too that the session is also being recorded, and so if you have colleagues uh, who, have, who, have, who have missed the opportunity to dial in, or if you would like to come back and listen to anything again, we will be posting it online. And uh, with that housekeeping out of the way, I will now uh, leave stage and introduce uh, our Chief Executive, Joe Hendy, who will um, begin, the, begin the session. Thank you. Thanks, Simon, and kia ora koutou. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go through a bit of background context, and then I'm going to hand over to an expert in this area, uh, one of our commissioners, Catherine Lining, to talk about our latest um, ETS settings advice. So just as a point of uh, grounding us and why we're here today, we are here today because emissions from our everyday activities are changing the climate and damaging the planet. And we need to work together to tackle this and create a thriving, low emissions, climate resilient future, making changes across all of our economy. We all have different roles in this transition. The Climate Change Commission is here to provide independent advice to government on climate action and to monitor progress. The government's role is to set the strategic direction for the country and put in place the systems, the laws and regulations that support this and to uphold Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. But ultimately, it is the people on the ground, businesses, communities, Māori collectives, households, who are the ones who will take the actions that will reduce our emissions and adapt us to climate change. Transitioning to a low emissions climate resilient future is not going to be simple. And this is fundamentally why advice independent from politics and grounded in evidence is important. Our independence is critical to what we do. It ensures that we can provide consistent, impartial, expert advice and monitor progress across multiple electoral cycles without fear or favour. It means everyone can have access to independent information to see how we are tracking towards our collective climate goals and where we need to do more. The work we are here to talk about today is specifically focused on the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme settings. The NZ ETS is a foundational element of our, our response to climate change. It creates a market incentive for many of the changes that will drive the transition to a low emissions economy. Some of you may um, refer to this as carbon trading, as well as an ETS. On its own, emissions pricing is not enough. It needs to be complemented by other policies that address barriers to change, but it is a crucial element to get right. Under the NZ ETS, the government does not set an emissions price. Rather, the market determines a price based on the fundamentals of supply and demand. The role of the government is to turn the dials that affect the supply of emissions units. In this report, the Commission provides advice on where the ETS dials should be set out to 2028. 
It is largely a technical exercise. This is because the emissions budgets have already been put in place by government. So the exercise of determining the ETS settings is really an exercise of determining how much those dials should be turned so that the ETS can drive the investment needed to deliver those budgets. Wider issues arising in the NZ ETS that are part of the public discourse at the moment um, and may uh, be front of mind for many of you are not part of the scope of this particular advice from the Commission, but are the subject of work we have done in the past and work we will continue to do in the future. So while we have this focused conversation today, it is important for us to keep in mind the Commission's wider advice stream. In May 2021, we made wide ranging recommendations across the economy. We advised the government that they needed to accelerate climate action and support the transition by using emissions pricing, removing barriers to change and investing in unlocking innovation. Another area we highlighted and to continue to highlight is the importance of upholding Te Tiriti Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, and the need for government policy and economic instruments to avoid compounding historical grievances and further disadvantaging iwi Māori. There are diverse views and, and perspectives from Māori to consider. We also highlighted the importance of policies to support an equitable transition. We are aware of cost of living pressures and advise government to use a broader set of policies to help those most in need with limited choices rather than stopping climate action so that the impacts of the transition do not fall disproportionately on those least able to bear it. Last year, we also gave specific advice on agricultural emissions, which are not covered by the NZETS. And we gave our first ever advice on the settings in the ETS. Our advice was intended to allow the government's key market instrument for climate action to work well and help drive down emissions cost effectively with support by well-designed complementary prices policies to drive efficiency, foster a sustainable transition and tackle the market failures blocking action that would reduce emissions. The government accepted most of our unit limit advice, but did not accept our price controls advice. This year, the government as always will have choices. And later in the presentation, we flag the consequences of choices and which elements of our advice must be considered together. We also, also recently submitted on the industrial allocation volumes based on a bill that government introduced around amendments to free allocation settings. We will get into further emissions pricing issues in our draft advice on the second emissions reduction plan, which we are opening consultation on next week, starting the 26th of April through to the 20th of June. With that, I'll now hand you over to Catherine to talk about the specifics of our NZ ETS settings advice. Thanks very much. Kia ora koto, ko Catherine Lining Aho. It's a pleasure to be joining you today to discuss um, our most recent ETS settings advice. I'm going to start with a little bit on how emissions trading works and then look into our specific advice and the rationale. So the ETS financially rewards climate-friendly actions and penalizes climate-damaging ones. It does this by requiring certain businesses to surrender units for the climate pollution for which they are liable. This includes emissions from energy, transport, industrial production, waste, and deforestation. Note the ETS covers six greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, as shown in this simplified diagram. The ETS encourages businesses to change how they do things so they can avoid having to pay extra costs. When these businesses can't change, they might have to raise the price of their products. This encourages the people who buy these products to look for cheaper, climate-friendly options. The units in the ETS, called NZUs, can be traded. And this trading creates a market where businesses who are finding it difficult to change can buy NZUs off of businesses who find it easier to switch to climate-friendly alternatives. New supply can be created in the scheme by eligible forests, sometimes referred to as carbon credits, 
Other units are provided directly by the government through auctions or free allocation. Under the scheme, these are all treated as the same currency. Like a game of musical chairs, every year the government takes away a certain number of NZUs, lowering the number available, reducing how much we can pollute in aggregate across the economy and help keep us on track toward our, meeting our climate targets. By keeping the overall number of units in the scheme in line with our targets, the scheme can support Aotearoa to achieve our emissions goals. Next slide, please. So what's our role? Well, the ETS is a regulated market with a number of settings that need to be defined. The commission has been given the specific job of every year recommending what these settings should be. This is the second time we've given this advice. The two sets of settings involved are unit limits, which are settings that specify how many units can be auctioned into the scheme or come in from overseas, and price controls. This includes a cost containment reserve and auction reserve price. These are price guardrails that essentially encourage the price from going too high or too low relative to expectations under our targets. The commission has to advise on what prices should trigger these mechanisms to apply and the additional auction volumes associated with the upper guardrail. These price controls are intended to act as safety valves that kick in and adjust volume up or down if the price is too extreme in one direction or the other. As shown in this image under the legislation, there have to be five years of settings in place at any time. Each year, we recommend the settings for an extra year, Y plus five in this diagram, and can review the settings for the last two years, Y plus three and Y plus four in this figure and re recommend changes to them. The settings for the immediate next year and the year after, Y plus one and Y plus two, can only be reviewed and changed in specific circumstances. Usually if there's been a significant change to one of the factors or the guardrails have been triggered and the settings for the current year Y0 cannot be changed. This way the market always has some visibility over the future settings of the scheme to help businesses plan, but it's adaptable enough to adjust to changing circumstances if it needs to. When we recommend ETS settings, we carefully consider a number of factors, including what's needed to achieve our targets, what's technically possible, what the impacts on people and the economy might be with specific consideration to impacts for Iwin Maori, what's needed for the ETS to operate effectively and what's happening overseas. In preparing this round of ETS advice, we have built off of and supplemented the foundational evidence analysis and engagement from our previous reports. Next slide, please. So an important piece of context here is that this is the second time that we're giving our advice on ETS settings. Our role is to advise, but it's the government role to make decisions on the settings and to put them into regulations. Last year, we made recommendations for settings for the whole five-year period from 2023 to 2027. The government broadly accepted most of our advice on the unit limits, with the exception of a technical adjustment we had recommended. However, the government mostly rejected our advice on price control settings. We had advised increasing both price control triggers as well as introducing two tiers for the cost containment reserve. The government did not make these changes. Having carefully considered the government's concerns and analyzed the updated evidence base, we continue to support the rationale for the changes we proposed last year and have reflected this in our new advice. I'll talk about this in more detail shortly. Importantly, under the act, the settings have to be in accordance with achieving emissions budgets, the 2050 target, and New Zealand's nationally determined contribution or NDC under the Paris Agreement. However, there is scope to not strictly accord if there is sufficient reason. We have been guided by this and by all of our legal obligations under the act. Our recommendations in this advice are to enable the ETS to stay on track to help deliver Aotearoa and New Zealand's emissions budgets and targets. Next slide, please. So what specifically did we recommend? Well, the first part of our advice is to recommend limits on the number of units that the government can auction into the scheme. We broadly applied the same methodology as last year, and this is summarized in figure four from our advice report. This is an adapted diagram here. I find it helpful to think of this as a layer cake. The green or the, the top uh, dotted black line in this image um, shows the ETS cap, which is the portion of emissions budgets allocated to ETS sectors. You can see the values are fixed for 2024 and 2025, 
and we are providing advice for 2026 through 2028. I'll start by addressing the stockpile. As many of you are aware, there is a large number of units that have accumulated over time in people's private accounts in the ETS. Now, banking of units is a useful feature overall because it supports flexibility and liquidity. But if a large volume of surplus units were surrendered in a short period of time, we could miss our budgets and targets. Last year, we recommended reducing auction volumes to draw down the existing surplus of units in the market by 2030. And we have retained this approach in our new advice. We applied the same assumptions about the size of the surplus as last year, as no further information had become available. We have made three substantial adjustments in our advice this year. First, we have repeated last year's advice to correct for a technical discrepancy in emissions reporting between the ETS and the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. This discrepancy results in too many units coming into the scheme. We have correspondingly adjusted our recommended volumes downward over 2026 to 2028 by 2.5 million units to account for this. Second, we have updated our forecast of how many units will be provided as industrial free allocation to emissions intensive and trade exposed businesses. They are now for forecasted under current rules to receive slightly fewer units than previously, which allows slightly more units to be auctioned. Third, and most significantly, we have adjusted the forecast split between eligible forests that sit inside and outside the ETS. For those forests that contribute to our emissions budgets and targets, but whose owners choose not to participate in the ETS, we make an adjustment and auction additional units into the scheme. Last year, we recommended that 5.6 million units be auctioned into the scheme over 2023 to 2025 to account for the forests that sit outside the ETS. However, as there was a rush of forest registrations into the ETS in 2022, our forecast is now that almost all eligible forests will be registered in the scheme and receive units directly. Accordingly, our adjustment is now much smaller and we recommend dropping the component of additional auction units to just 0.8 million units into the scheme over 2023 to 2025. Because the settings for 2024 and 2025 are fixed, we have backloaded these adjustments into the settings for 2026, 2027, and 2028. Next slide, please. Thank you. This figure does not appear in our report, but it's useful to show the overall implications of our advice for unit supply relative to current settings and our 2022 ETS advice. The overall volume of units is still aligned with emissions budgets, but you can see a more significant decline in auction volumes between 2025 and 2026 beyond current settings and into 2027 as well. It's important to make these changes to ensure the scheme is aligned with meeting emissions budgets and targets. You'll see in our advice report that we have also covered a possible scenario where the triggering of the price controls at auction in June, 2023 would create the option to revise unit settings in 2024 and 2025. This is a hypothetical scenario, but it is within the realm of possibility. This option to revise the unit settings for 2024 and 2025 would provide a more gradual reduction in auction volumes, since it would reduce the upfront over allocation we are aiming to correct in our primary advice. Just before I move off of this slide, I do want to clarify what I stated earlier. Um, the decline in auction volumes is seen for 2026 and 2027. I misspoke earlier. I'll come back to how we set the volume of cost containment reserve units available to the market after I've gone through our advice on the price control settings. Next slide, please. So what did we recommend on price controls? Well, first of all, again, there are two price control settings in the ETS, the auction reserve price and the cost containment reserve. These should not be confused with the emissions price. The market determines the emissions price. These price control settings operate at the government's auctions and provide a safety valve to manage the prices being wildly out of line with achieving emissions budgets. The auction reserve price withholds units from auctions if the clearing price is below a certain level. The cost containment reserve will add more units for sale if the clearing price is above a certain trigger price level. The cost containment reserve acts as a break on further price rises. 
The auction reserve price and cost containment reserve are price are meant to be set outside the range of prices expected to arise in the market. However, this has not been the case in recent times, which indicates that the current settings are not at appropriate levels. The cost containment reserve has been triggered three times in the last seven auctions. So last year, we recommended a substantial increase to the trigger prices. Raising the trigger prices provides significantly more headroom for the market so it can do what markets do best, discover the most efficient price. We also recommended that the cost containment reserve be split into two tiers. The teal and orange lines in the graph are our recommended trigger prices for the two tiers. I want to reiterate that the levels provided here are not a forecast or an indication of where emissions prices may go. If our recommendations are taken, they should provide a wider price corridor that the market can operate within. The dark blue lines in the graph are the current price controls, which have a much narrow corridor and lower settings. The government rejected our advice last year, citing concern that the market is anchoring its price expectations to the cost containment reserve trigger price. It also cited concern that its equitable transition strategy is not yet in place, if, and, if, and if the price was to rise, it could affect um, households. But since the government made its decisions, new information has emerged to which the market has responded, and this gives us further evidence on which to base our advice. Our engagement and market research suggests that the ETS market is setting emissions prices based on a broad range of drivers, such as climate and non-climate policies, technological developments and mitigation opportunities, global commodity prices, changes to economic growth and geopolitical conditions, and trends in other ETS markets. Since December 2022, the market has weakened considerably. This trend has continued through to the 15 March auction, which was declined due to bids not meeting the confidential reserve price, which ensures the government does not sell units significantly below the price on the secondary market. Our advice is that significantly higher trigger prices are justified to put them well outside where the market may need to operate to be consistent with meeting emissions budgets. We judge it unlikely that any potential magnet effect would be sufficiently strong to cause prices to rise to that level. However, we will continue to actively monitor NZU prices as part of our annual ETS settings advice and to build our insights regarding market behavior, including market expectations and the potential impact of price anchoring. Since we cannot recommend changes to the settings for 2024 and 2025, our recommendations start from 2026. From there, our price triggers are the same as we recommended last year adjusted for inflation. And as is the case for unit limits, if the price controls were to be triggered at auction in June 2023, then our recommendation, recommended cha changes to price triggers could start from 2024. Next slide, please. We have also made recommendations on the volume of units in the cost containment reserve. As I mentioned earlier, we expect these units not to be easily accessed source of supply for the market. To decide on the overall volume in the reserve, like last year, we set this equivalent to the volume of surplus stockpile units we want to draw down each year. This way, if it is triggered, the surplus will not increase, it will just not get any smaller. We have then had to decide how to split the total reserve across the tiers. We decided on two tiers because that way, if cost containment reserve units were released, not all would become available at once, reducing the number of units adding to the existing surplus. The first tier is sufficient to bridge the abatement gap if policies don't go as expected. The second tier is the remaining surplus drawdown. It becomes available only at much higher prices if the transition has headwinds. This way, we're helping to put the scheme back on track to delivering budgets. We have heard concern during targeted engagement that privately held units, uh, particularly those held by foresters, might not be available or only come available at high emissions prices. While acknowledging this concern, we consider stockpiled units are spread among a large number of participants, and we expect they will sell at a variety of prices, just like any other market. But in any event, we think releasing large volumes of reserve units is not a good response to this risk. If the ETS is to be a proper functioning scheme, 
It needs a cap that aligns with emissions budgets. I'll now hand back to Joe to discuss how the commission's advice fits in the wider picture of the government's climate action. Thanks, Catherine. So to, to finish up on this part of the webinar, um, the uh, government has choices about whether it takes our advice and how it operates the scheme. A key point we wanted to emphasize this year is that some elements of our advice are a package and can't always be treated like a menu of different options. For example, the volume of units in the cost containment reserve relates to the prices we recommend. If the government wants to continue to have a single CCR trigger price, it should adopt a lower volume of units in the CCR. It does not make sense to allow so many units to become available at prices that are within the bounds of the transition task at hand. More broadly, the decisions the government makes now on climate policy will have consequences for the future. While neither pricing alone nor relying on regulations alone is likely to deliver the outcomes New Zealand is seeking, if the government chooses to adjust the settings in line with our advice, then they're making the choice to have the NZ ETS playing a stronger role in aligning emissions with emissions budgets. If government chooses to constrain the emissions price or auction additional supply units into the scheme, then the ETS will play a weaker role. And the government will need further regulations and other policies to drive emissions reductions to ensure emissions budgets are met. If the government expects the NZ ETS to contribute significantly to the abatement needed for budgets and targets, the scheme must be given room to do so. We are very aware of the cost of limit living impacts on people right now, and that many New Zealanders are facing tough times. Weakening decisions on the NZ ETS settings and climate policy in general during hard economic times, which climate change is only likely to exacerbate, is not sustainable in the long run and will greatly compromise our chance of meeting the climate change targets set out in the Act. The government needs to use its current suite of tools to manage economic impact so that the NZ ETS can play its best part in assisting Aotearoa New Zealand to reduce emissions. Recent initiatives like the COVID-19 support payments and half-price public transport show that the government can act fast to counter cost of living impacts as a bridging op option. While it's getting those policies started, the government has tools to manage the impact of costs passed on to those with limited choices. If it were to, for example, increase benefits and superannuation, those on the lowest incomes who have the least ability to adapt can be shielded. In the longer term, we will often be better off as many of the investments made now will more than pay for themselves over the, uh, their lifetime. And while, and as businesses and households invest to reduce their emissions, people's exposure to the emissions prices will reduce. While it may be tempting to constrain the market to avoid cost impacts, we would then miss out on the benefits that come from allowing the market to drive change, missing opportunities to invest in low emissions actions, and instead continuing down the path of investing in actions that damage the climate. From here, the government will consult publicly on these settings and we expect that consultation will begin soon. The government will then make decisions and finalize them into regulations by the end of September. That gives everyone three months notice of what the settings will be before they come into force at the beginning of next year. This will be the regular timetable that we follow each year. Our timetable last year was a knock-on consequence of the delay created by COVID disruptions, which delayed the emissions budgets decision and therefore our first settings advice. We will give our next advice on the NZ ETS settings in the first quarter of next year. Before that, we will also be consulting on our draft advice on the second emissions reduction plan where we can address some of those wider issues related to ETS that are broader and are than these settings in this particular advice. And with that, 
it's time to move on to questions. So I'm going to hand back to Simon to uh, MC uh, the Q&A part of the um, webinar. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Catherine, for um, that presentation. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that are coming through on the chat now, but I remind everybody to please continue to um, put your questions up. The first question is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, because settings are locked in for 24 and 25, there is a very significant jump in 2026, which is clearly quite disruptive for the market. How did you weigh this sudden jump up versus other factors? Uh, Catherine, would you like to have first crack at that? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Um, ETS participants make decisions on supply and demand based on their long-term expectations for supply and demand. We are in a situation in the market where there's a considerable oversupply in the market. So the, um, that's a very important consideration. And participants are going to be keeping an eye on the longer term picture. So we consider what's most appropriate is to correct um, over allocations and supply um, at a good pace and, and that that should be sufficient for the market to, um, to adjust. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, our second question, is from Shailene Hattel at PwC. And the question is, um, thanks for the great session folks. Can you please talk to the assumptions made to forecast the industrial free allocation and what the key drivers to this projected trend seen in the report are? Sure, so the um, updated um, projections basically are based on current rules. They don't reflect any of the changes that are under consideration um, in the bill, which uh, Joe was referring to in her comments. So the changes that have been made are based on changes to forecast production levels um, for the current industrial allocation participants, given the stage of, of free allocation that's available right now for in emissions intensive um, firms at, who are moderately intensive or highly emissions intensive. Um, those forecasts are consistent with, uh, with government expectations. So there were not any major changes in terms of participants entering or exiting the market. It was just more looking at changes in forecast output based on um, the allocation decisions from the government. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Keith, who is uh, representing Environment Southland. And Keith asks, have you seen emission pricing start to reduce carbon emissions? Uh, any examples would be interesting. Great, thanks very much for the question. Um, the, there is a two year lag in uh, emissions inventory reporting. And so there, there can be a, a wait to see what the exact impact of emissions pricing is going to be across different sectors. Um, we are seeing movement in terms of industrial um, boiler investments. Fonterra is one case in point um, with their uh, operations in Waikato and in Nelson. Um, we have seen other investments and talked to stakeholders who are being influenced by the emission price to help get uh, uh, emission reduction uh, investments over the line. We're seeing the increase in renewable energy consenting and new build. So these types of considerations are being reinforced by the emissions price and, and it's helpful. But over time, as we get more emissions data reported, we'll have a better sense of how different parts of the, of the market are responding to emissions pricing. Yeah. And just to add to that, the Commission also has a monitoring role, um, which our first monitoring report is due uh, at the middle of next year, um, and that will be looking at our progress towards our um, emissions budgets, our climate targets more generally, um, and uh, and how the um, emissions reduction plan is um, uh, playing out on the ground. Uh, there's a question in the chat here. Does the Climate Change Commission have views on the possibility of delinking forestry units from the ETS? Shall I take a first step at that one, Joe? And yeah. So in our advice in Anayo Tonune, we raised concerns about the incentives that are being created for forestry and the emissions trading scheme and flagged the need for this to be addressed as a matter of urgent policy. Um, we will be addressing this issue in our advice on the emissions reduction plan uh, number two, which Joe mentioned uh, will be undergoing consultation starting next week. And the government has also launched a review of the role of forests in the ETS, and we'll look forward to engagement on that. So this is an area where uh, we have certainly registered our concern and are looking for solutions. Uh, 
And just to reiterate, um, we'll be releasing our uh, consultation document the 20, on the 26th, and that opens up for a two-month um, public consultation period where we're um, encouraging all of you to share your thoughts, concerns, insights with us um, before we, so that we can use it to finalise our um, advice to government at the end of um, this year. To you, Simon. My apologies. I'm sorry. Just a slight technical um, question there. Um, another question that we've got in here is: Is the Climate Commission considering alternatives to the ETS to control emissions? Well, so more generally, um, in Anaya Tonune, as I said earlier, we set out that framework uh, for um, the climate transition, which relies on emissions pricing. It relies on uh, policy to deal with barriers to change and also unlocking innovation. So we look across the suite of those policy tools when we are providing advice on emissions reduction. Uh, we are um, also, as we've put out in this advice, there is a choice for government to make around the role that the NZ, they want the NZ ETS to play in our transition. And depending on where they want to position the NZ ETS, because it's a tool, right? It's not a strategy, it's one of the tools in the toolkit, then that will um, have implications for how much uh, they, uh, the government will need to put um, additional emphasis in um, using those other uh, um, tools available to them in their toolkit. Catherine, do you want to add to that? Well, I think that was an excellent response, Joe. Um, you know, the ETS is really one, one powerful tool in a toolkit that, that needs to be diverse, and I think you've addressed it very well. Thank you. Our next question um, asks, has the government given any initial feedback on recommendations, and have they expressed if they're comfortable with the price movements since they decided not to implement the price settings in last year's advice? Sure. As, at this stage, um, the Minister of Climate Change has acknowledged our advice and um, signaled that it will be carefully considered and decisions have not yet been taken. Um, certainly market participants and government officials are very aware of what's happened to the price um, since the last settings were announced, but there have also been other contributing factors to that. So I, I suspect the government will be looking at the combined effect of changes in market circumstances, uh, as well as our new advice to make its decisions. Thank you. And uh, as a next question we have is, when estimating the size of a stockpile, how have the potential carbon liabilities for registered post-89 forests been taken into account? That's a pretty specific question. <clears throat> so there is a lot of uncertainty around the size of the surplus, and our team has worked hard to analyze um, a range of options. Uh, we've looked at the levels of which we're expecting um, firms to be hedging some of their liabilities when they owe units under the system, and they've looked at the possibility that units are encumbered because of post-1989 forestry obligations and also of uh, units that were freely allocated for pre-1990 forests and the likelihood of those being released to markets. So we landed on a central estimate that did take all of those factors into account and which sits at about 49 million tons, but that's within a range from 33 to 66 million tons. Um, so we are attempting to account for this. Now there is a chance that uh, if um, emissions prices are so much higher than when landowners initially made investment decisions that a different number of those units could come to market over time. And one of the benefits of being able to make annual adjustments to ETS settings is that we can take changing market conditions into account and, and adjust for this. So if our estimates of the surplus um, do change based on market participants' expectations, we can take that into account in future settings. Thank you, Catherine. And um, while you while you have uh, the mic, another question we have in here uh, that's good for you is if trees are the most cost effective way of reducing net emissions, why not rely on complementary policies to address any other externalities or costs and maintain a clean focus on net emissions in the ETS? Uh, 
Well, as Joe was explaining in her introduction, all sectors are contributing to the problems with climate change and all sectors have the potential to contribute to solutions. So forestry absolutely has an important role to play in, in helping with removals. Um, however, in order to transform our economy so that we thrive under global carbon constraints in the long term, we really need to transform all sectors by reducing gross emissions and moving as close as possible to um, um, very low or, or zero gross emissions in, in sectors. So while forestry can make a contribution emissions pricing shouldn't be restricted to forestry and can work across all sectors. Uh, a policy that only provided emissions pricing to forestry or only incentivized forestry um, would provide a really unbalanced re uh, response that I don't think would deliver the kind of successful low emission economy that Aotearoa needs. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we have another question here. Can we explain, can the commission explain the connection between the excess of units and net zero carbon in terms of the net offset. Lots of units seems to suggest lots of offset to meet our NDC. There's a possible combination of issues in that question. Um, can you read the question one more time, please? Sorry, so the question was, can you explain the connection between the excess of units and net zero carbon in terms of the net offset? Lots of units suggest lots of offsets needed to meet our NDC. Okay, I'll try to um, separate out some of the issues in that very good and very complex question. Um, the, our uh, emissions trading scheme currently operates with the large surplus that I was discussing in the presentation, and that surplus um, largely accumulated before 2021 due to previous settings in the system. Those um, units have rolled into the new Paris period of 2021 to 2030, um, and they are eligible for use in emissions trading scheme, but they're not backed by mitigation that gets recognized under our Paris target. So in a sense, though, that surplus of units that gets carried over makes it harder for us to meet our Paris target if those units get released to the market and we haven't planned for that in advance. This is why we are trying to build in a surplus drawdown to help um, reduce the risk that these surplus of units built up before 2021 could, could affect our ability to, to meet our target. Um, there is a gap between the emissions budget pathway that New Zealand has adopted and our 2030 nationally determined contribution. Um, the government has signaled that it intends to meet that gap through offshore mitigation. And so that is one way that it can um, help to compensate for um, domestic emissions um, not aligning with our NDC. Um, one of the issues that we've identified in Anayo Tununé and have repeated in our ETS advice is that there's currently a lot of uncertainty about how that offshore mitigation will be secured and what role the ETS will play in that, um, whether participants will have a role and, and then if, if not, how it will interplay with supply decisions in the ETS. So this is an important area for trying to clarify um, government policy decisions. So um, this, this issue of offsetting, we need to think separately about surplus units that built up before 2021 and about the gap um, that we face in our 2030 NDC under current um, situation and how offshore mitigation can help with that. Thank you, Catherine. That was uh, indeed a, a tricky question. Um, our next question is, does the commission have a view on what the right price should be for NZUs? On one hand, there is the price incentive cost balance. And considering at the moment that the ETS seems to be incentivizing planting trees more than reducing emissions. Um, sorry, that was the question. So I'll, I'll repeat that again because I wasn't particularly clear. The question was, does the Climate Change Commission have a view on what the right price should be for NZUs? On one hand, there is the price incentive slash cost balance. And considering at the moment the ETS seems to be incentivizing the plant of trees more than reducing physical emissions. Great, thank you. Well, from our perspective, there is no right price that will de deliver the outcome. And the purpose of an emissions trading scheme is to set supply in line with our targets and let the market discover what the most effective price is. Um, there are different emissions prices that will drive mitigation in different sectors. And one of the issues we're encountering right now is that the price that incentivizes changes in forestry is considerably lower than the price that's needed to drive changes in stationary energy and transport and waste. Um, and that's why the current system is incentivizing a lot of forestry, um, potentially at the expense of, of gross emissions reductions. So we need to think about what prices are effective for driving mitigation in different sectors, and then how we can adjust price exposure in different 
sectors to produce the outcomes that we want under our target. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we have around 15 minutes left, so room for a few more questions. The next question is, the government's December decision severely impacted market confidence, as can be seen by the price retracement. Do you have any thoughts on this and the future implications, given we can't decarbonize at the current $60 a tonne market price? Well, I think the impact of the government's decisions on ETS settings in December is one of several factors that have contributed to the softening of emissions prices since then. There have been a number of policy announcements in other parts of the economy. Um, there's what's happening with inflation and supply chains. Um, and there, there's also um, how companies are, are responding to this. And there was the, the news that came out about how much additional forestry was registering in the system so quickly. So I think it's this convergence of factors that has supported um, the, the softening of prices. Um, and I, I think there was concern in the system that if we maintained low cost containment reserve trigger price levels, that makes it much more likely that the cost containment reserve gets triggered and that contributes even more to the oversupply that we already have in the market. So I think participants were probably reflecting concern about that as well. And that's what's behind our advice to increase those triggers so that the cost containment reserve is useful um, if, if circumstances really go far beyond what's expected, but it doesn't get triggered on a routine basis as we've seen in the past. Uh, we consider that our advice would help to restore the confidence that we're trying to align supply with our emissions budgets and help keep the, the market on track to help meet our targets. Thank you, Catherine. Um, our next question is, is the Commission concerned about Treasury estimates of the potential cost of acquiring offshore credits to meet our NDC, particularly given the Commission's advice on reducing the role of forestry and the risk that any reduction in forestry creates um, realizing that creates the realizing of those higher offshore costs. The um, information on offshore mitigation purchasing is drawn from a number of scenarios, looking at what our domestic emissions would be under emissions budgets and then under lower and higher uh, reduction scenarios. And then it also looks at potential sources of emissions um, from developing countries, um, you know, ac across sort of other systems and then under, you know, more advanced economies. So there's a very broad range of what those costs could be. It goes from a roughly $3 billion to $27 billion over the period. And we think this is an area where the government really does need to clarify um, how it's planning to source offshore mitigation with high integrity, get a sense of what prices are involved and plan for that in advance. Um, the role of forestry is important, um, but we need to be thinking long term about how forestry positions us to meet our, our target through 2050 and beyond. Keep in mind, we need to be able to source forestry offsets to continue to compensate for the sectors that we can't necessarily take all the way to gross zero through 2100 and beyond. So if we were to use up all of our forestry potential in the shorter term, we lose this opportunity to use more forestry in the longer term. And it's really important that we keep all sectors on track to decarbonize as rapidly as possible so that our economy is prepared to sustain net zero emissions in the longer term. Otherwise, we just defer the investments that we really need and that comes at a very high cost later on. So we really need to be keeping that long-term perspective um, in, in view here as we look at what the best role is for forestry. Um, what offshore mitigation does allow us to do is to stay on track with an ambitious domestic mitigation pathway while boosting our global contribution and helping other countries to accelerate their reductions at the same time. So it can be done very well when it's done with integrity and when it doesn't displace the domestic decarbonization that we need. Yeah, I think it's also um, really useful to always remember that uh, new forests that we plant now are going to contribute very little um, for this current um, NDC out to 2030, because it takes about five years or so for the carbon sequestration to get going. The new forests planted in the next few years are going to help with the next NDC, but not the current one. Thanks, Joy. Um, a question in a similar vein is, how do we think gross emission reductions could occur without incentivizing more forestry? Well, allowing the emissions price to um, increase um, to help to drive the incentives would really help. 
Uh, there is also the potential for um, other policy and regulatory interventions to help to um, remove barriers to responding to the price signal, um, to help to uh, encourage innovation and, and investment. Um, so I, again, our, our, our preferred approach is advocated for in, in an IO Tonine, sorry, suggested in an IO Tonine is really to combine emissions prices with removing the barriers um, to, to responding and, and to increase innovation. We really need those three things operating together as a package. Um, we do consider that um, emissions prices, sorry, that um, gross emissions will respond in other sectors to emissions prices, but those, those price signals will be different in different sectors. The responses will be different in different sectors and we might need additional barriers to be addressed in different sectors. Thank you. And in the, in the um, theme of sectors, a question here is being asked, has there been a review across different industries and how they are considered and operate? For example, design and construction are now looking at low carbon assessment from the gate to cradle process. Um, so the ETS settings work and the ETS is really about the um, driving action across all of our economy within a cap rather than in uh, with those sectors that are covered by the ETS. Now, our wider advice uh, on the um, direction of the second emissions reduction plan, we are actually, um, it's there where we also look into individual sectors and what additional uh, policies, the types of policies or outcomes we might seek uh, beyond what the ETS is uh, able to do. So, as I said before, our consultation on the second uh, emissions reduction plan direction of advice, uh, direction of policy is due uh, to come out next week. And that's exactly the kind of um, input that would be, we'd really welcome during our consultation period. Thank you, Joe. Um, and here is a uh, really great um, mark, technical market question. Um, so that, which, I'll, which I'll hand to you, Catherine. It's said that the failure to sell any units in the recent auction is because the bid price did not meet the confidential reserve price. Is this the case? And can you please explain more about how the confidential reserve price is determined and why it's kept confidential? Sure, thank you, that's a good question. So the confidential reserve price was added in the 2020 amendments to the system. Um, we, the auction reserve price sets a minimum price below which the government cannot sell units at auction, but there was still the potential for units to be sold at auction um, considerably below the auction price in the, sorry, but below the secondary market price. And so the confidential reserve price was introduced to help to align um, auction outcomes with the secondary market prices, and that's a, a better outcome for, for taxpayers. People use the term that the, the last auction failed, but I prefer to think of it as being declined because actually this shows that the system is working. Um, essentially what happened is that um, given um, the level of supply in the market, prices fell, and um, so we didn't introduce further units into the market through auctioning. Um, so the purpose of this mechanism, the confidential reserve price, is to uh, allow this alignment. Now it's maintained confidential to uh, it's as, as a confidential price to prevent gaming behavior um, by the market, and um, so it is not a part of the commission's advice. It's done by the minister um, under the oversight of the auction monitor. Thank you. Um, we've got just a few minutes left, so probably time for two or three more questions. Uh, the question I've got here is, is there any update on advice regarding if the aviation and shipping industry is to be included in the scheme? Sure. So, of course, this is a, um, a piece of advice that the Commission is due to give to government uh, next year. We uh, have already started work on this um, and we uh, put out a call for evidence to input into that work stream, which is uh, live now and um, will remain open until the 31st of July 2023. We will also be looking at uh, doing further engagement over the and consultation over the um, full period of the um, lead up to when that advice is um, due to be delivered next year. So uh, we welcome uh, evidence through our call for evidence uh, uh, process, and we are also going to um, be uh, giving plenty of opportunities for engage engagement and consultation through that process. Thank you, Joe. And we'll just have one last question and we'll wrap up with a forestry question. 
Um, when discussing concerns of oversupply of NZUs due to forestry offsets, does this include or exclude the assumption that New Zealand will find 99 million offsets from other countries? Are there any countries that the NZ government thinks might have surplus offsets? Um, so the government has been um, monitoring options for offshore mitigation uh, for several years now and is exploring opportunities. We have seen other governments entering into contracts to transfer uh, international mitigation outcomes or ITMOs under the Paris Agreement under Article 6. Um, Switzerland is a particular leader in this, so there are opportunities out there. Um, there are many forms that offshore mitigation channels could take. Um, one of those would involve linking the emissions trading scheme to another ETS system. Another would be a bilateral agreement between the New Zealand government and another government to um, exchange uh, mitigation between countries. So this is a feasible option. Um, however, time is ticking away and the government does need to confirm what um, channels it plans to use and how those will, will interact with the ETS. When we are looking at making um, our unit supply decisions in the ETS, again, we have um, accorded with our emissions budgets, um, our 2050 target and the NDC by treating emissions budgets as the domestic contribution toward our NDC. So we are looking at the overall supply of forestry in the context of meeting our emissions budgets as the domestic contribution toward our NDC. Thank you, Catherine. And look, I know I said there was, that was the last question, but we've just got one more that I'll try and sneak in. Can you say any more about the Climate Change Response Amendment Bill submission on industrial allocations? Do concerns about rule changes creating over allocations suggest the government's having difficulty managing ETS on a stable price pathway to meet targets? And what can be done? Well, the purpose of this uh, amendment bill that's currently under consideration by the Environment Co uh, Committee is to try to stop over allocation to um, our emissions intensive and um, um, and trade exposed uh, industrial producers who are eligible to receive those units. So I think that objective of trying to reduce over allocation is really important. That really helps to support uh, the decarbonization of our industrial sectors and keep us online to meet our targets. Our concerns with the bill are around some of the suggestions for how to address this over allocation. And in particular, there's a proposal to revise the um, eligibility thresholds based on emissions intensity. The proposal is to scale that for changes in emissions prices over time Time, and we consider that this uh, piecemeal approach would not provide a good outcome uh, and it would come at high taxpayer expense and put additional pressure on, on uh, emissions budgets and targets. So we are very supportive of the direction of the bill, which is to prevent this over allocation, but we feel that it needs some further improvements before it should move ahead. And it should, if it's going to try to take a better approach at addressing real leakage risk, it needs to do that effectively and not through a piecemeal approach. Um, that is a separate issue um, from keeping the ETS on a reliable price pathway. Obviously, we need all parts of the, the market to be operating with integrity and to align with delivering on emissions budgets and targets. So I think trying to fix over allocation problems in industrial allocations is a positive step. And we also need to take these other steps to make sure that um, other sources of, of potential over allocation through the auction system are being addressed and that we address this forestry question and clarify where offshore mitigation will be heading in the near term. Thank you very much, Catherine. And look, with just a minute to go, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, Catherine and Joe, I'd like to thank you both very much for the presentation and for um, all of the questions that you have provided answers to. Uh, I would like to thank all of the attendees that we've had online today. There's been uh, more than 150 at certain points. And so uh, that's a really great response. Thank you very much for coming and for attending. Uh, and I would like to now uh, close today's session and wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you.